Now we are especially delighted to have back amongst us the Reverend David McMillan, uh, no stranger to you, converted here and uh, has uh, a member of this community for quite a long time and uh, we're delighted to welcome him back. So you're very welcome back to Carrie Duff. Um, Reverend McMillan, this is sort of a coming home for you, isn't it? Uh, that's, that's, that's exactly right. He, he's got a couple of messages in song, and he's going to sing for us just in a little minute. And I, I'm going to read a portion of scripture because it's been in my head, and I want to share it with you. I'm not going to preach on it. Reverend McMillan will come and sing, and then we'll ask the treasurer then if he'll come and bring his financial report. And what I would like to just read to you is Psalm 56. Psalm 56. And if you think of the child of God, <clears throat> think of the man of God who would raise his head above the parapet and speak for Christ and uh, expose sin uh, and seek to say that certain lifestyles are not right, they're contrary to the word of God. Um, and think of all the attack that is leveled against him, then that will put it into the picture. Uh, this was happening to the psalmist a thousand days, or a thousand years before Christ uh, ever came. Psalm 56, let's just read the 13 verses together, and then the Reverend McMillan uh, will come and sing for us. Psalm 56. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for they be many that fight against me. O thou most high, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Every day they rest my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. Shall they escape by iniquity? In thine anger cast down the people, O God. Thou tellest my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? Amen. We trust that God will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Reverend McMillan. It is very nice to be with you at your annual meeting tonight. I appreciate the invitation uh, to be here very much indeed. I was thinking it was in this pulpit that I first sang a solo, maybe some 35 years ago, or thereabouts. I remember that night because uh, my legs started to shake uh, quite a bit, and I thought that the way to solve that problem was to put all my weight onto that leg. And that might stop it. Well, it did stop that leg shaking, but the other one started then. <laughs> so it, di it didn't cure it completely. This, this is a wee piece my father planned it all. It's a great thing uh, to know that we have a sovereign God. Amen. And his hand is upon our lives in, in every detail. And it just reassures us that whatever's taken place in our lives, whatever circumstances that we're passing through, that our Heavenly Father has planned. Uh, for our good and uh, for his glory, all of those details. My father uh, planned it all.
darkness shadows fall, I know where'er it leadeth, my Father planned it all. I'll sing through the shade and the sunshine, I'll trust Him whatever befall, I'll sing for I cannot be silent, my Father planned it all. There may be sunshine tomorrow, shadows may break and flame. I'll trust him whatever befalls. I'll sing for I cannot be silent. My father planned it all. He guides my faltering footsteps along the For well he knows the pathway will lead to endless day. I'll sing through the shade and the sunshine. I'll trust him whatever befall. I'll sing for I cannot be silent. My father planned. It will fall. Tis this at last awaits me. My father planned it all. I'll sing for the shade and the sunshine. I'll trust him whatever befall. I'll sing for I cannot be silent. This second piece is uh, take me back to the old fashioned meeting. When we think of our land and the spiritual condition the land is in tonight, and sadly the spiritual decline uh, that is all around, this is the burden and uh, the prayer of our hearts. Uh, we can remember many old fashioned meetings, even uh, in this building, uh, uh, down through the years. Uh, this is the place where my mother received her education, but it's the place, as the Reverend McLaughlin said, where I experienced uh, God's salvation. Amen. In the little room out there, uh, the first Sunday night of 1979, uh, it was the 7th uh, of January that year, after the Gospel meeting, and it was an evening meeting, or a, an after meeting uh, in those days, after the other evening services folk would gather here. And Mr. Paisley preached that night as he did on the first uh, Sunday night of every year. Every new year he came mm -hmm. uh, to the schoolhouse here. And we went out and knelt beside him. He was bigger on his knees than I was on my feet. I'm still not very big on my feet. But uh, we knelt beside him that night and uh, he led us to the Saviour. And what a meeting that was. And we pray the Lord will take us back again uh, to those old-fashioned meetings. Amen. Changes. He 
He's the same yesterday, today, for a. Once I came to the Lord with my burden, dark and sin nearing hell day by day. Then I heard Jesus saves the poor sinner. So I came in that old fashioned way. meeting lead me on in the old fashioned way for the Savior I trust never changes he's the same yesterday today for a now I'm walking each day Savior, and He guides me and keeps me all the way. He will save your poor soul, listen, sinner. Come by faith to the cross, come today. Take me back to the old fashioned meaning. Lead me on in the old-fashioned way. For the Savior I trust never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, for a. Thank you, Reverend Mellon, for this ministry and song. And of course, that's what we yearn for. Take me back to the old fashioned meeting. I could say more than that, but we'll leave it. I'm going to ask the treasurer now, Mr. Smith, to come and introduce us to the financial report. Well, I still don't know what to do if my legs shake. <laughs> so, <clears throat> in Psalm 13, the psalmist begins the psalm with saying, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? But the last two verses of the psalm <coughs> is the two verses that I want to read. It says there, But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord. That's what our brother has been doing just now. Amen. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. The annual report, it's hard to believe we're almost into the month of May in 2015. The annual report uh, for 2014 we're dealing with Tonight, and if you can see an annual report, uh, there might be a couple more in the hall. We'll just go over. Don't take. Don't hope to take too much time. Uh, we'll just go over it quickly. You can read uh, most of it in your own time, and any questions you can ask some of us later. The summary there, financial report summary, starts with receipts, the opening balance, £169,694. And the receipts then, £53,199. And this is up by £4,800 in the previous year. Mainly due to the increase in the weekly offerings on the Sabbath day and an increase of approximately 1300 in our building fund. And that brought our building fund up to 10,358. Now the expenses there came to £44,109, leaving us with a balance of £178,784 £178, in our church accounts. 
A significant event financially was paying off the bank loan for the manse. And it's always good to get a loan paid off and to say that you owe nothing uh, to anyone. You owe nothing, especially to the bank. And so now the manse is ours as a, as a church and as a congregation. Now note one, uh, you see the receipts, they're detailed in note one. And with any work, the receipts there, you can see the general offerings, the envelopes and the loose. The loose now was up a good bit on the previous year, maybe up £2,800. And then there were special offerings, those uh, people that came to speak to us at Wednesday night meetings. And then there was other income from the mission uh, during the spring and the harvest Monday service. And Ballycone Royal Black Preceptory, the harvest service there, where a brother always has been preaching now for the last uh, few years. We thank them for their offering to the building fund. But with any work, there are always expenses. And expenses are detailed in, in notes 2 to 6. Note 2 is the minister's wages, etc. Note 3 is the man's expenses, and that includes uh, the paying off of the remaining debt. Notes 4 and 5 then over the page, they detail the necessary church expenses. And you can run uh, through them there. Uh, there's hampers, spring mission expenses, visiting speakers and singers, and of course there's electric to pay for the heating. And well, I guess you need heating on even in the month of April. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you're asked to buy some strange items. And 2014, I was asked to buy a drum kit. And I wonder what, I, what, what a drum kit would be for. The Reverend McLaughlin came and said, we need a drum kit. <laughs> and then Sammy came and says, we need a black drum kit. You know, if Sammy comes and says something, well, you have to go and get it. But don't worry about that. It's, we're not going modern or into all these newfangled things. This was a drum kit for the laser printer and was part of the laser printer to, to keep oh, it going right. and to keep the ink running smoothly and to keep the pages printed out every week, your bulletins. It needed a, a drum kit. So there you are. You can be asked to get some strange items. <coughs> but in note six then, we see gifts. And as a church, we have been able uh, to support worldwide evangelism over 2014. And it's always a great privilege to be able to send money on to the various speakers who come along to explain about their particular sphere of the Lord's work. You can see there with Mr. Noel Stevenson from the Philippines. And he was speaking twice, once in the month of January and once at the end of the year in the month of December. And Evelyn Compton. She told us about her role as a teacher in the school in Senegal. But the meeting I most remember was the Wednesday night Mr. David Calderwood and his wife came along with Mr. Calderwood speaking and giving a word of testimony as to how the Lord had saved him and led him over these many years. And you know, we don't often tape those meetings, but that would have been one meeting that I would love to have had uh, a tape off or a memory, it's great, certainly a great memory and a great blessing and encouragement that was to us all and of course the work in Nepal is to the fore now with the latest earthquake and the death toll rising every day we were also able to help out in India Dr. Chelly and you can see the Whitfield College to let the Bible speak, different spheres of work that our church and denomination is involved in Below that then, we have gift aid envelopes and free will envelopes. And we do thank you for your regular uh, income via these means. Without gift aid, we would not be able to meet all our financial commitments. But remember, as the Reverend McLaughlin often says, every little helps. And so it does mm. in the work of God. Before that, we see the bank accounts, the building fund, uh, includes interest-free loans and I can tell you today that the building fund stands at £171,139.79 and that's an amazing amount that we've managed to gather up over the last few years 
uh, especially as we've been paying off the manse loan as well. And different people have remarked as they've seen uh, the finances coming in in different places, how well just a small congregation uh, gives to the work of the Lord. And if we were to say one word about the, this report, it would be the word bountifulness. Proverbs 29, 22 verse 9 says, He that uh, hath the bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. In 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 we read, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. May the Lord help us to be bountiful in our giving for his eternal glory alone. Could I just say a word of thanks to the session and committee for their help and a special thanks to Wilfred and Barbara here for their uh, financial advice and help over the year too. Uh, it's great to have people to go to when if you uh, need wisdom and uh, uh, it's great to get that wisdom and to get the right advice. Could I just say a personal word of thanks too for your prayers uh, since 2013. August when my father hadn't been very well we weren't expecting him to live at that time and he rallied round and he's still uh, going quite strong today he doesn't be out much now but he's still able to go out and drive the car the odd time and uh, we do thank you each one for your prayers thank to the Reverend McMillan here for visiting my mum and dad whenever he was the minister up there in Muller Glass uh, it was always encouraging to hear that he had been to visit them and they always told me that they were always glad to see him and uh, maybe my father showed him around the farm I don't know, yeah. different implements round about and uh, maybe showed him how he ploughed years ago in the fields uh, with the three horses with the two for a plough that's not something that I've ever done So, <laughs> but we do thank you for your giving we thank you too for <coughs> those new families who have come into the congregation and we, but we also remember those who aren't able to be with us on the Sabbath days, we think especially of Mrs Crawford Senior and we do miss her presence and the presence of uh, our elderly folk who are not able to be with us even during the service, so thank you very much And we do thank the treasurer very much uh, on your behalf. We know he puts a tremendous amount of work into um, keeping our finances uh, up to date. And um, we would just want to say to you, uh, Mr. Smith, in the Lord's name, uh, may he richly bless you and Wilfred and Barbara as well for the help that they give in the uh, finances of the church. We want to thank Barbara too for playing for us and we know that others uh, stand in the gap at times and that's another ministry uh, to the glory of the Lord. Uh, I, I am quite pleased with the financial report for 2014 and I concur exactly what Mr Smith has said using the word bountifully. I believe the Lord has really undertaken for us and, and blessed us and helped us in this regard. We're going to ask the Reverend McMillan to now come and bring God's word. Thank you. It certainly is very encouraging uh, to see how the Lord has oh, blessed, have ble right. blessed you here uh, during the past year again. I, I can remember uh, the meetings right at the very beginning uh, of the work here in Carried Off. Uh, I remember coming to the Sunday school uh, here from almost uh, the very beginning as well. Uh, the late Mr. Robert Lowe called at our home, as he did in every home in the district at that time, and invited parents to send their children uh, along to the Sunday school. And I can still picture in my mind uh, Mr. Lowe standing at our back door, speaking with my mother, and encouraging her to send us down uh, to the Sunday school here. And we thank the Lord for that, and for our brother's burden and vision in those days. It was really through coming here that I first heard uh, the gospel, uh, the first time that I ever heard uh, clearly and plainly presented uh, the message of the gospel 
and uh, the way of salvation. I remember that opening mission too, that Mr. Paisley preached at. We, we came a few nights, but uh, just the way things worked out, uh, Mr. Paisley wasn't here any of the nights that we came along. Uh, he was always tied up somewhere else. The, the famous male uh, testimony band uh, from the martyrs, uh, some of those men came along and took meetings uh, at that time uh, as well. But we, we were blessed through those meetings. Uh, I could see a great difference uh, difference between uh, day and night from, from the meetings I was used to in the, the Presbyterian Church in Saintville. What, what a blessing. The power there was in those meetings and the life uh, that was in the preaching uh, of the Word of God and we were uh, drawn to them. And I remember for years... Uh, coming down the road here on a Sunday night, walking down most nights, uh, the mile or so, and uh, some of you folk, uh, some of the Lowe family in particular, took me back up home, wanted to make sure I got home safely again, but took me back up home. And I remember coming to the Sunday school. Of course, I was a model student, the best behaved child that ever came <laughs> to the Sunday school here and carried off. The first thing I normally did when I came into Sunday school was knock the hat off the girls that were sitting in their own in front of me. Uh, I say that to my shame, but I say it for your encouragement too, because sometimes there's difficult children come to Sunday school and you're exasperated and you don't know what to do with them. But it's good to remember you don't know just what the Lord can do uh, with those little ones and with their lives uh, in, in years to come. So very fond memories of uh, those early days here uh, in, uh, in killing your school. Remember being at those meetings that we mentioned when Mr. Paisley would come and uh, the place was packed to capacity. It was very, very difficult to get a, get a seat to get into the building. And uh, we, we rejoiced just in the memories uh, of, of those days. But we're thankful uh, to the Lord for the encouragement uh, that he's given uh, to you. And we commend you for your, your faithfulness, uh, both in the support of the work and your faithfulness to you in your, your generous uh, giving towards uh, the support uh, of, of the work. Uh, down in Armagh, as Mr McLaughlin has mentioned, uh, th this is a special anniversary year. It's a double anniversary year. On January the 4th past, it was the 40th anniversary of the opening of the church building. We had a special meeting that Sunday evening. It fell on the Sabbath uh, this, this year. Uh, the Reverend McRae came. He was there and sang at the opening uh, 40 years ago. So he came and testified and sang for us and we had a great meeting. He reminisced a little of some of the events and circumstances of that day uh, 40 years ago. And then in the autumn time, on October the 10th, it will be the 50th anniversary of the founding of uh, the congregation. Dr. Paisley was born in Armagh City and he was invited to hold a gospel mission there in the late summer of 1965. It started on the 22nd of August and it went for six weeks. They had to extend the tent to accommodate the people that were coming up to 800 people attended uh, one meeting and 107 people were converted uh, at that mission. As it was drawn near an end there was a request to con commence a free Presbyterian church uh, in the town. It was Armagh town uh, in those days and uh, through prayer the, the, the Watson home, uh, Mrs Doris Watson uh, is still the organist of the church. It was her husband Sam, the late Sam Watson, that wrote to Dr. Paisley in 1962, inviting him uh, to come and hold that mission. And every night after the mission they went to their house for supper and there was prayer meetings held. And it was as a result of those prayer meetings they decided to commence the Free Presbyterian Church in, in Armagh, the first uh, in the county uh, of Armagh and the 12th uh, Free Presbyterian Church. Uh, church that it was at that time. The Reverend William McRae was a member of the Armagh Church in those early days when he was first converted. Uh, it was the nearest Free Presbyterian Church to where he lived in Stewartstown and he did tell us a little about that when he was there that night about his father uh, driving him down uh, to those uh, early uh, meetings. So we're celebrating uh, that double anniversary uh, we have produced a little leaflet, uh, a short history of the congregation, uh, just to mark uh, the anniversary year. I've told you the introduction. Uh, there's copies of those of this little leaflet available tonight. They're free of charge. We'll, we'll bring them down to the door and you feel free 
uh, to take one, and you'll be able to read uh, the story uh, in full. On the actual anniversary this year, it will fall on a Saturday. We've had a, an annual March of Witness this last few years. Uh, we apply to the Parades Commission. Uh, I know we complain a wee bit about them, but you know, if, if they approve a, a parade for you, there's great advantages to it. We, we take a route down through our mass city that takes us up the one-way system the wrong way. And they have approved it for us every year that we have applied for it. And the police come and close the road. And we march up with the Ballytron Accordion Band playing some very nice hymn tunes for us. And the young people carry a, a banner in front of the band uh, with that great text on it, It's Time to Seek the Lord. The people give out uh, gospel literature as we go along. We hold an open air beside the Danske Bank in the, city, uh, the centre of the city. And then we march on through the city, down the other side, down College Street, back up the mall, up the hill uh, to the church. We always come back very encouraged. When we come up the street and the band playing, you can see the people coming out of the shops everywhere. They think it's the 12th of July all over again. They want to see what's going on. Where's this band coming from? And then when we get back to the church, we always have a wee time of tea and fellowship together before we go home. I'll tell you a humorous thing that the first year that we had that, March of Witness, when you fill out the form you have to say how many bands there's going to be and how many people following the band. So we put down one band and up to 150 people. Now whenever uh, they approve your application, all this openness nowadays, it all has to go up onto the website. And when they put it up onto the website, whoever typed it up got the details a wee bit confused. They put on the website 150 bands and one person. <laughs> the, ma good. the man said to me, that's you, brother, that one person. <laughs> we, were, we were thinking, what will the country not be thinking those boys down in Armagh doing with a parade of 150 bands? But some 12th of July parades wouldn't have uh, 150 bands. But we intend this year, because it's an anniversary, and it actually falls... Uh, the March of Witness will fall on the anniversary itself. We're, we're going to invite the churches round about. There's seven congregations all in County Armagh that were founded uh, through people that originally attended uh, the Armagh Church. And we're going to encourage their minister and members to come and join us. Amen. That then we'll have a, a very good, strong uh, March of Witness down through uh, Armagh uh, City Centre. We had prayed the Lord would give us a token for good uh, this year, and we believe. Uh, the Lord has done that for us uh, already. Uh, a few years ago, the church was thinking of moving out of Armagh to a new site out the Hamilton and Spawn Road, and they bought four acres of ground uh, to do that. But we decided then, uh, not long after I, I, I went to Armagh, that we would stay on the site uh, where we were. There's quite a story behind the purchase of that site as well. Mm. But we did apply... Uh, almost two years ago, August 2013, we applied to, uh, to have outline planning permission to build some houses on that side out the road. The difficulty being that the site is outside the planning boundary. So you can imagine there is a, a, a great difficulty. There is a, a policy that at that stage was just in draft form, uh, known as enabling development. Uh, in short, what it would mean is if the money that you're going to raise from that development it's going to be sunk into another development. It's not going to go into somebody's private pocket, but into another development that would be for the public benefit, the community good, then that they will uh, consider it and possibly set aside uh, the normal planning rules and grant your permission. We, we had a long battle with the planners over that. We appealed. Uh, we were. It was suggested to us that we should appeal our case to... Mr. Mark H. Durkin, uh, the Minister for Environment. Initially, we were refused that appeal. We, we appealed again, and they granted us a meeting last November. We went down the clerk of session, myself, our architect and planning consultant, and we had a very good meeting with him. We, we, we came away genuinely believing that he had taken an interest. He had listened very carefully to what we said. We invited him to come down to Armagh, to the church, uh, to see what we were doing and uh, to see what we wanted to do. Now, the politicians that were there, that they said, you know, he, he never come, uh, but he did come. The following month uh, was the North-South Secretariat meeting 
uh, in Armagh City. They, they hold those meetings in the, the Armagh City Hotel. And his office rang up the day before to say that uh, Mr Durkin was going to call at the church after uh, the Secretariat uh, meeting. And uh, he came with his personal advisor, uh, a lady called Mary Bunting. Mary Bunting uh, is a senior civil servant. She had actually retired. Nicola Mallon, who last year was the Lord Mayor of Belfast, was Mark Durkin's personal uh, assistant, uh, his really personal advisor. But to become Lord Mayor, she had to step down from that position. And Mary Bunting was seconded in uh, for the year. Mary Bunting is the sister of the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Armagh. And when Mary Bunting came with Mr Durkin, uh, she took a great interest in the church and asked a lot of questions. He was actually surprised himself, Mr Durkin, how many questions uh, she asked. We were told that he relies heavily on the guidance of his advisors. Well, the, the long and the short of it is uh, they approved the application. Amen. Uh, in the month of February, we, we got word that the planning list uh, for the Armagh City Council meeting in March had been issued and that our application was number one with a recommendation uh, for uh, approval. Especially significant was the fact that that was the last meeting of the old Armagh uh, City Council. So we took great heart and great encouragement from that. Uh, even more, uh, you, you think, is there more that I could tell you? Well, there is more. About a year or so ago, in the process of this whole application, we had a meeting with the then planning manager in Craigavon, who was a man called uh, John Linton. He, he was of a mind to approve the application, but he suggested, we, we had originally applied to have uh, six houses. We just asked for a small number. We knew that where it was situated, if we asked for a large number of houses, it would scare the planners off uh, immediately. And uh, we asked for a small number, six houses, thinking that maybe they might knock us back to five. And we asked for the six houses to be spread out over the entire site. Nice big sites. Somebody wanted a site for a paddock behind for the pony and all, all the rest of it. But Mr Linton suggested, because of where it was located, that if we ever were to have any hope of having this approved, it would all have to be pushed up to one end. And the rest of the site, it's a four acre site, the rest of the site then planted out with trees and that would help to hide it and blend it into the environment. So whenever we got word it was going to be approved, we didn't know which layout was going to be approved. We said to Mr Durkin, we told him the whole story when we were at Stormont, we said we'll accept any approval, we'll be happy if you approve either layout but we want you to know that our preference is for the original layout. When it would come to sell that, uh, that would be more appealing and it would bring in more money uh, for uh, the church. We had to wait longer than usual. Normally you find out in a week or so <coughs> if it works out, but because of the backlog with the new super councils coming in, it was maybe six weeks before we actually got uh, the approval notice through uh, from the council. But the gave us all six sites and they, they approved the original application of August 2013 with uh, the six sites spread out over uh, the entire piece of ground. So it has worked out for us this year as well as ever we could have hoped or as well as we ever could have expected. Uh, our main goal in all of that is to get back for the church all the money that has been spent on, on it uh, to date. Uh, we do want the church to become a casualty of uh, the property slump and so on. Anything that we get over that uh, will be uh, a bonus, but it, it certainly has been very positive, a great token for good, and with the little upturn in the market, it's certainly looking uh, very, very promising. We have been engaged in uh, a whole program of refurbishment, for about the last three and a half years, uh, a, th a quarter of a million pounds has been spent on the church building, refurbishing it. As they enter into this special anniversary here, the witness has been carried on in facilities that are almost completely refurbished. There's, there's still just a few small jobs to do. But they've been able to do all of that work 
uh, without going into debt. And that has been a tremendous thing uh, as well. And we started at the beginning of this year to do a wee bit of work outside. Uh, we have spent almost another £50,000 on the outside. Uh, one of the things that was erected this year was a road link. Those of you who have been in Armagh will know there's a front car park and a back car park. And for the last 50 years, if you wanted to go from the front car park to the back car park, you had to go out uh, into George's Street, round by the prison, up the Market Hill Road, turn into the Folly Estate and come in the back entrance. It was quite an ordeal. But now you're able to go between the back and the front car parks without having to leave uh, the church property. We had a nice local official opening of that uh, a couple of Sunday mornings ago, uh, just after uh, the morning service. And in conjunction with that, we had a very short service just to do that, we had the dedication of a, an anniversary tree. It's planted just in the bank opposite. Uh, we actually called the road link Anniversary Avenue. We gave it a very uh, grand and official title uh, for the opening uh, as well. So we've been very uh, encouraged uh, just with uh, all that has been uh, uh, going on. Uh, if you're down our way, call in and you'll be able to see. Uh, let us know you're coming and I'll give you the royal tour and show you around all that has uh, taken place. But we, we are very thankful and we pray uh, that, that the Lord will help us uh, as the work is furthered. We have outlined plan and permission to build a hall in the back car park and uh, any money that's raised from uh, the building uh, or from that uh, building development out the road will go towards uh, the building of uh, the church hall. So we certainly do value uh, your prayers in that regard uh, as well. I'll just mention to you before we come to the scriptures, uh, we're taking a wee trip to Israel uh, this summer, the 29th of June to the 10th of July. You'll be back in time for the 12th. If you'd like to come or you know anybody would be interested in coming, uh, there are still a few places uh, available. And it certainly would be very nice to have some friends from Carrie Duff uh, come with us. It's 11 uh, days and 10 nights uh, that, that we're going four up in Galilee and six down and around uh, Jerusalem. So do keep that. It is very near the point where we'll have to finalise the numbers, but if, if you would be interested, uh, speak to us just uh, about that. One wee verse just in the book of Exodus, please. It's the book of Exodus, and it's the 14th chapter uh, of the book. And it's the words of the 15th verse that I want to take just as our text for a few minutes tonight. Exodus 14 and verse 15. It tells us, And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. And it's those words at the end of the verse I want to emphasize. Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. David Livingstone, the famous missionary to Africa, once said that he would go in any direction so long as it was forward. And brethren, that's what I want to emphasize uh, to you tonight. An annual meeting essentially is a night when we look back. There's a reminiscing that's taking place in a sense. You're looking back over uh, the work, particularly the previous year. But we want to turn your gaze uh, for a moment or two to the future uh, as the work carries on and continues and want to impress upon your hearts uh, the words of this text. Here's the Lord's word, the Lord's message to you tonight as you've been encouraged at your annual meeting, as you've heard report given and testimony to the Lord's goodness and faithfulness to you. And as you think of what do we do, where do we go from here as a congregation? Well, here's the Lord's word to your heart tonight. Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. And I want to emphasize to you, brethren and sisters, that that's a command that is often found in the word of God. There are many places. You think of 
the words that Peter uh, closed his second epistle with, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Something that's growing is increasing, it's developing, it's going forward. And that's what the Lord wants you to do in the Christian life. He wants you to grow, develop, progress and go forward. You think as well of Paul's words to the church at Corinth. He said we're always to be abounding in the work of the Lord. That word abounding has the idea of going beyond where you've been before. We're we're never to be content. We're never to think that we've arrived. There's nothing more for us to do or there's nowhere else for us to go as a Christian or as a congregation. We're always to be abounding in the work of the Lord. So I want to emphasize that to you tonight, brethren and sisters. It's God's will for you personally as a Christian and it's God's will for you collectively as a congregation to be going on and to be going forward in the things of God. You're to advance and you're to progress in the Christian life and in your witness uh, for God. You're not to mark time. Maybe that's what you've been doing personally for the last year. Maybe that's what you've been doing as a congregation. You think of a, of a band of soldiers on the parade ground marking time. There's a lot of noise and there's a lot of activity, but there's no progress. They're, they're not going anywhere. They're, they're not going forward. We're not to mark time. Billy Sunday, he would present the same idea only using the picture of a canary in the cage. A canary sitting on its perch and it's making a lot of noise and it's flapping its wings and there seems to be a lot of activity. But the poor wee canary is not going anywhere. It's still in exactly the same place. And there's many Christians and there's many churches just like that. We're not to mark time. We're not to stand still. Moses was wrong when he said to the children of Israel to stand still. That wasn't God's will. That wasn't God's word. God said you're to go forward. We're not to stand still. And we're not to stagnate, brethren and sisters. And it's certainly not God's will for us to go back. It was not the sad lament that the Lord had to make of King Saul. He's turned back from following after me. Essentially, he was a backslider. And maybe that may be true of someone here in, in the meeting uh, tonight. Here's a timely command, brethren and sisters. As you gather in the year 2015 for, for your annual general meeting, Here's what the Lord wants you to do as you face the future. He wants you to go forward in the work of God as a congregation. There's some areas of the Christian life I want to mention them to you, emphasize them just quickly. As we think of going forward and going on, some areas in the Christian life in particular that you need to focus your thoughts and your attention (coughs) and your efforts upon, some areas where you do need to be making progress going on uh, with God. Can I mention, first of all, your service? You need to go forward in your service uh, for Christ. I want to exhort you tonight, brethren and sisters, that you do more for the Lord this year than you did for the Lord last year. Look away back to the 1859 revival, wasn't it? The Reverend Moore that said to those young converts, about doing something more for God. And that's what the Lord wants us to do while we've health and while we have opportunity. Mr. Moody, the famous evangelist, came back from a meeting one night to the hotel where he was staying. There was a man sitting in the foyer of the hotel waiting to speak to him. The man jumped to his feet, introduced himself. He said to Mr. Moody, I was converted at a meeting that you preached at 14 years ago. But before the man could get another word out, Moody said to him, What have you done for the Lord since? And it's not a good question, brethren and sisters. I've told you a little tonight of when I was converted, those 36 odd years ago. Will you think tonight of how many years it has been since you were converted? And then ask yourself the challenge in question, What have you done? What have you done for the Lord? What have you done in his service to extend his kingdom since the day you were uh, converted? It's a very good question. Think of the judgment, men and women. The Bible says we will all stand before 
the judgment seat of Christ. And remember on that day, the Lord will not be interested in how famous you became, how popular. He'll not be interested in how wealthy you became while you were here on this earth. How much money you accumulated, how much property you obtained, or how far up the corporate ladder you were able to climb. On that day, the question will be, men and women, what did you do for me? The Lord will say to you, I gave you life and breath. I gave you health and strength. I gave you gifts and talents. I put money in your pocket. And the Lord will call you to account for how you used those things in his service. Do you remember the words? We often repeat them. Sometimes we hear them so often, they maybe don't have the effect upon us that they ought to have. But remember, we have only one life, and it will soon be passed. And it is only what is done for Jesus Christ that will last. Do you remember the the seven churches in the book of the Revelation? Did you ever notice there's only two of those churches the Lord could command? The other five he had to condemn them for their works and for their witness. And as the Lord looks down upon your life, and as he looks down tonight upon you as a congregation, which of those would it be? Do do you have the commendation or the condemnation of the Lord upon your life and upon your service? There's a little statement that David used, 1 Chronicles 29, in relation to the gathering of the finances for the building of the temple. And a sad little statement, who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? See that little word consecrate? Very interesting. It has the idea of filling your hands. Who then is willing to fill his hands this day in the service of the Lord? You think for a moment, of what your hands have been filled with today. What have your hands been filled with in the past year? What have your hands been filled with from the day that you were converted? Is it only and ever the things of this world? Or have your hands been filled with the things of God? Your hands been filled with the service of Christ. George Whitfield, it's very interesting. Mr. Whitfield died in North America in a place called Newburyport. You, you will know we as a family lived and laboured in South Wales for a number of years in a place called Burryport. Probably people from South Wales moved out to North America and the place where they settled it, they called it after uh, the place that they left uh, in South Wales. But this is how George Whitfield died. He had preached in the church, the old South Presbyterian church in the town, And he preached for about two hours. Uh, George Whitfield literally preached himself to death. You would think after a two hour sermon. The people would have heard enough for one night. But they hadn't. When he went back to the manse. The congregation actually followed them. Back to the manse. And a great crowd of people gathered outside. And they pleaded with George Whitfield to come (coughs) out. And preach to them again. And he stood on a little veranda with the Bible in one hand and a candle in the other. And from the light of that candle he preached to them the word of God until the candle burnt out. And then he said to the people, the candle has gone out, men and women, and I really must retire for the evening. He had quite a restless night, but sometime early in the morning, around six o'clock, he slipped out into eternity. A number of years later, a, uh, years later, a Christian lady heard that story. And she thought the candle was like a picture of the life of George Whitfield. If the candle had burnt out, so had George Whitfield. Burnt out in the service of Christ. And she wrote that lovely gospel hymn, Let me burn out for thee, dear Lord. I wonder, men and women, is that your burden? Your desire, your prayer tonight. Is that your outlook, your vision for the future? You want to burn out in the service of the Master. I urge you to go forward in your service. Something that's closely related to that. Think of going forward in your 
soul winning efforts. Remember, we cannot save. It's God alone that saves the soul. The Bible says clearly, salvation is of the Lord. But remember, God uses instruments in that great business of soul winning. What a wonder that is. The Saviour said, if you follow me, I will make you to be fishers of men. And I want to emphasize to you tonight, brother and sister, that catching men, it is God's will that you be used in that way, that you give your life and your life be used in the winning of others to the Saviour. There's some fishermen in the congregation in Armagh spend the summer in competition, the one with the other. We were down at the Castle Dillon Lake with the young people last summer and they were trying to teach the young people a wee bit about fly fishing. The young people mostly weren't that interested. Some of the comments were quite boring. Uh, this they, they weren't that very interested. I don't know an awful lot about fishing, but I know this. He would be a poor fisherman who catches no fish. And yet, you know, brethren and sisters, the sad thing is there are many Christians like that. They've, they've caught absolutely nothing. Ne- never led a soul to Christ. Or if they have, it has been a long time since last they won somebody to the Saviour. Do you remember the words of, of uh, Peter to the Saviour? Toiled all the night and caught nothing. Can I ask you tonight as you think of your own Christian life, your own efforts in the Christian life, is that what you'd have to say tonight? You've toiled, toiled for all those years and caught nothing. Never won a soul to the Saviour. I want to urge you, brethren and sisters, you need to go forward in your soul winning efforts for the Lord. Here's what I want you to take upon your heart tonight at your annual meeting. Take upon your heart the matter of praying for souls to be saved. We have not because we ask not. Pray specifically that the Lord would use you this year to win one soul to the Saviour. If you read the story of John Hyde, he was such a man of prayer that he became known as Praying Hyde. When John Hyde was in India, he prayed that the Lord would give him one soul every day in a, in a certain year. And the Lord answered his cries. the end of that year, over 400 people had been converted. And heartened by that, he prayed the next year the Lord would give him two souls every day. And before the year was out, over 800 people had been won to the Saviour. Can I urge you, you pray this year. This year the Lord would give you one soul for Christ. What a difference that would make. You think of coming back to your annual meeting next year. If everybody here this evening was a soul winner in the next 12 months and brought one soul uh, to Christ. It says in the New Testament the number of the disciples was multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Well, the smallest multiple you can have is two. And what a difference that would make just to have the congregation multiplied if everybody, as as Sam Houston used to say, one, 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 and so on, all all, all the rest. If you read Willie Mullen's life story, there's a chapter in that book, Tramp After God, And it tells you all about what was then known as a tape ministry. That seems very archaic to us today. His tapes went all around the world. A young fellow from Belfast was out in New Zealand one time. And he attended a certain church on a Sunday morning. And the pastor found out he was a visitor from Northern Ireland. And he said maybe he'd give a wee word of testimony in the meeting. And in the course of his testimony he said, I was converted under the ministry of a man called Willie Mullen. If you've ever heard of him, he thought, away on the other side of the world, who would have ever heard of Willie Mullen? Well, the congregation laughed when he said that, when he made mention of Mr. Mullen. He was a little taken back, and he he turned to the pastor. He said, why did they laugh when I mentioned Mr. Mullen's name? The pastor stood to his feet. He said, would anyone in this congregation this morning that was saved under the ministry of Willie Mullen please stand? And over 200 people and the congregation rose to their feet. You read the chapter, read the story for yourself. 
a soul winner, men and women. It says that Barnabas, and I, I remember that the, the text I'm going to quote you is the text that Mr. Paisley preached on at the night of Mr. Lowe's memorial service here in this hall. That little text that Barnabas, he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. And what a testimony that is, men and women. Is that not the way you would want to be remembered? Whenever your life is over, good man, good woman, full of the Holy Ghost, lived your life by faith, and most of all, while you were here, much people added unto the Lord. You won many to the Saviour. I urge you, brethren and sisters, there's a great need to go on in your soul-winning efforts for Christ. I'll mention one other area of the Christian life where you need to go on and it's relevant thinking of the annual meeting tonight, and that is your support. Think of your financial support of the work of God here. It is true, uh, it does bear emphasising and underlining God's work needs your financial uh, support. The work cannot be carried on without the regular and generous giving of the people of God. If you think of missionary work, (coughs) there's only two things, two responses that you can give to the challenge to missionary work. Either you go yourself, and if it's not God's will for you to go, then what the Lord wants you to do is give. Give of your money, give of your prayers, maybe even give of your children, your sons and your daughters. As Abraham laid Isaac on the altar, maybe that's what the Lord wants you to do too, to lay your children on the altar <coughs> and say, Lord, take them and use them to your glory. But remember, the Lord wants you to give of your substance uh, to his work. You think of those words in the book of Proverbs. Honour the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Honouring God is a very interesting thing. There's many ways we can honour God. We can honour God with our speech, the sort of language that we use. We ought ever to speak as becomes a Christian. We can honour God with our conduct as well with our life, with the way that we live. But never overlook the fact, men and women, that the Bible teaches you should honour God with your money, with your finance as well. Honour the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. That first fruits is very interesting. The Old Testament, the first fruits belong to the Lord. And it's encouraged in the scriptures. Maybe the first pay packet you get in a job give it to the Lord as a testimony to his goodness the first pay increase you get every year you see it still has application it still has relevance to us uh, today you're familiar with the warning in the Bible we cannot serve God and mammon that's something we need to be careful about that money doesn't get too big a hold upon our lives, that we just live uh, for money instead of living for the Master, instead of living for Christ. We cannot serve God and mammon. But remember this, men and women, you, you can serve God with your mammon. You can serve God with the money, with the finance that he gives and that he blesses uh, you with. If I could give you an example of that, I'm sure you're familiar with the late T.B.F. Thompson of Garva, a very wealthy businessman, a very good friend of Mr. Paisley's, a very good friend of the late W.P. Nicholson as well. Mr. Nicholson often stayed in T.B.F. Thompson's home. You can read the life story of Mr. Thompson. Uh, It was a book printed by Ambassador uh, a few years ago. I don't know whether you're familiar, Mr. Thompson set up a trust, the TBF Thompson uh, Trust. And many people in Christian service have benefited 
uh, from financial donations from the TBF, Thompson and Trust. I know a number of young people that wanted to go out to the mission field on mission trips over summer times and they applied to the TBF Thompson Trust and got a little grant, got a little donation. He set that up many years ago, long before his death, but he wanted his influence to carry on. He wanted to be able to help the Lord's servants and the Lord's work long after he was gone from this scene of time. So remember, you can serve God with your mammon. You can use the money God has blessed you with for the furtherance of his kingdom. Let me ask you to think of the question, who do you bring the money to? Well, remember, it's not the church, and it's not the denomination. It's not the committee of the church either. If that's your motive, if that's where you have your focus, your focus is wrong. It's upon the wrong thing, and it's in the wrong place. Remember that you're bringing the gift. You're bringing the money to the Lord himself. And if you get your eyes upon the Lord, that'll make all the difference. That'll make the giving that wee bit easier. Those of you that used to go to martyrs years ago, Mr. Paisley would often say, we'll sing a good hymn at the offering. I think he got that from Mr. Nicholson. It takes away the pain of parting. Well, the thing that really takes away the pain of the parting is getting your eyes on the Lord. Amen. And just thinking of all that the Lord has done uh, for you. Do you remember when they were building the tabernacle? In the Old Testament times, the Lord said this, bring me an offering. He didn't say bring Israel or bring Moses. He said, bring me an offering. And that's what makes all the difference, brethren and sisters. And I want to encourage you. It was great to hear tonight in the report that there's been an increase, a very significant, a very definite increase in the giving of the congregation here during uh, the past year. Take heart and encouragement from that. And I encourage you to go forward in this next year in your financial support of the work here that carried off. I encourage you to tithe. Remember that tithing is the clear teaching of both the Old and the New Testament uh, scriptures. I I don't really have time uh, to go into that too much tonight, but I want to emphasize that fact to you. It is the clear teaching of all the Word of God. Christians ought to tithe. The tenth of your income ought to be given to God's work. And if you've never tithed before, if it has not been your practice, then I encourage you to begin that practice in this year, uh, 2015. Remember that there's a distinction made. It's found in the book of Malachi, the third chapter. Tithes and offerings. The offering is what you give over and above Uh, the tenth and the tithe or the tenth actually belongs to the local congregation let me me emphasize that to you it's something that's often overlooked something that many Christians have never considered it's the teaching of the scriptures the tithe belongs to the local congregation bring all the tithes in to the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith if I will not open you the windows (coughs) of heaven do you know why many churches struggle financially it's one because Christians don't tithe and two because they don't bring their tithe where it ought to go to the local church to the local (coughs) uh, congregation to the local witness that they are a part of so I want to encourage you uh, to do that It's wrong for you to think, when you're considering your tithe, I'll just give a wee bit of it to the church, and I'll give the rest to this organisation that I'd like to support, or to that missionary that have an interest in their work. All the tithe comes to the local church, and anything you want to give to that organisation or that missionary, that's the offering that's over and above uh, the tithe or the tenth of your income. Think of this too. 
you're not to stop at the tenth either. The, the tenth is the minimum that you can give to God's work or should give to God's work. Uh, I remember Dr. Frank McClelland preaching on this subject many years ago. And he told the congregation that what he and his wife had done a number of years before that, they, they had started at 10%. The next year they gave 11 The next year they gave 12 The next year they gave 13 And so on. So you can add, if you want to go forward in your giving, your financial support of the work, Remember that as far as the teaching of the scriptures is concerned, the tenth is the least. It's the minimum that we ought to give to God and to his work. And remember, God will bless you. Be in no doubt of that, men and women. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and running over, will the Lord give into your uh, bosom. So I urge you tonight, go forward, brethren and sisters. Speak on to the children of Israel that they go forward. Go forward in your service. Go forward in your soul winning. Go forward in your support. <coughs> I'll tell you this story as I finish tonight. Napoleon, the great general, was involved in a battle. And the battle wasn't going very well. In actual fact, it looked like defeat. And there's a little drummer boy that stood beside Napoleon. And he would from his drum beat the commands, the signals, out onto the soldiers on the battlefield. And Napoleon, thinking of what was happening, said to this young lad, beat a retreat, laddie, beat a retreat. He wanted to call the soldiers in. But the young fella hadn't been on the job very long. And he looked up at the great general in horror because he said, Sir, you never ever taught me to beat a retreat. You only ever taught me to beat a charge. So Napoleon thought for a minute. He, he was in a wee bit of a corner. He didn't know what to do. So Napoleon then said to the young lad, Well then, laddie, beat a charge. Beat a charge, laddie. And he did. And it turned, it raised the morale of the troops. And it turned what looked like defeat into victory. And you know, brethren and sisters, it's the same in God's work. The Lord has never, ever taught us to beat a retreat. It never has been and it never will be God's will for us to go back Mm. can I impress that upon your heart tonight as you think of the work here it never has been and it never will be for God's will for us to go back for us to retreat do you remember the words of that old hymn what they call in America the battle hymn of the republic he hath sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat it never will be God's will for us to turn back in his work it is always and only and ever God's will for us to go on and God's will for us to go forward and and I want to emphasize that to your hearts tonight brethren and sisters speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward may God bless his word